Julie, it's uh, great to have you here with us. It's, it is a, a real privilege. Um, you once said that things change when you fall in love, and I fell in love with the ocean. How did you fall in love with the ocean? Tell us about your journey. Thank you so much for having me here. It's such a privilege. I'm, I'm just delighted to be able to talk to you today about corals and jellyfish in the ocean. Um, it turns out I grew up in a place that was very, very landlocked. I grew up in Missouri, which is in the center of the United States. And I, I think we went on a couple vacations to the beach as a kid, but I had never seen, I had never looked beneath the, the surface of the water growing up. And then when I went to college, I went to college in Israel, and I was, I, it was just, a, I was uh, miserable. I had a bad program, <laughs> and I, I was having trouble making friends, and I ate too much falafel, and it was just a, a rough place for me to be. And there was a sign on the side of a building, and it said, Marine Ecology Course, one week in a lot, and I thought, send me there, I need to go. So I, I signed up, and they put me on a bus, and I went through the desert and got out, and I was like, oh my gosh, these mountains are red and they're beautiful and this ocean is blue and it's sparkling. And someone just threw a mask and a snorkel at me and I stuck my head beneath the water and I saw these coral reefs and I, I couldn't believe like in that moment, and maybe you've had this experience of seeing something that changes the way you think of the world, but I just couldn't believe we lived on the same planet as this beauty, this color, this vibrancy, and I had never known it before. And so I got out of the water and I'm like, I'm gonna be a marine biologist. But, um, you know, life doesn't go in a straight line. But really, that was the beginning. I mean, I think when you see how much life there is on coral reefs and how diverse and colorful, I mean, you said it in your introduction, it, it really is a true treasure that we live here on this planet with. So, um Let's get to the nub of the matter. Why are coral reefs so important for us? Yeah, so coral reefs exist um, in basically what is the desert of the ocean. Mm -hmm. So tropical parts of, they live in the tropics, you know, and the tropical regions of the ocean are really nutrient poor. There's not a lot of fertilizer there. So they should be like deserts. They should be voids of a lot of life. But what coral have done is this incredible thing. They are animals, so that's like step first thing. They're actually the first cousins of jellyfish. If you imagine a jellyfish flipped upside down and then connected to other jellyfish through their stomachs, that's basically what a coral is. But what coral have done, which is sort of this brilliant thing, is they've teamed up with an algae. And the algae lives in their tissues like ta a tattoo, like inside their tissues. And that algae photosynthesizes like all green, green life does on our planet. And it feeds 90% of the sugar that it makes through photosynthesis directly to the coral. And that is an incredible fuel source. It's more fuel than any animal living in that part of the ocean should have access to. And so what the coral did with that great source of fuel is decide to build architecture to segue from the past conversation. And so they build these great limestone reefs. And those reefs become habitat for all these other thousands of species. And so they are among the most biodiverse um, ecosystems on our planet. And as a result of that, they feed about a billion people with their primary source of protein. They are also the best storm barrier we, we know of. If you have a storm coming towards land and there's a healthy coral reef there, it will diffuse 97% of that storm's energy, preventing erosion and damage that comes on shore with those storms, which we know are growing ever and ever stronger. And then um, there's you know, tourism and the economic driver that, that coral reefs um, produce, and that's estimated to be around $2.7 trillion per year. So coral reefs have outsized influence, and I should say that coral reefs only take up about less than a percent of the ocean. But even given that, their influence is so outsized. Oh, one more thing. Coral reefs um, provide a home for about a quarter of all marine species. So their, their influence is just enormous given their footprint. And I think I'm right in saying around about 500 million people on this planet are dependent upon coral reefs 
in terms of livelihoods, um, yeah? Even more than that in terms really? of livelihoods, but that number is for their primary source of protein. Right, okay. So, yeah. Um, now, we know that uh, with climate change, global warming, um, the effect that's having on uh, the oceans, what is damaging corals, and can that process be uh, reversed? Uh, we've just read recently about significant regeneration in the northern part of the Great Barrier Reef off the coast of Australia. Is that just a blip or something more significant? Um, well, th so let me start with the first part of the question. Sure. So what is damaging coral? So I told you about this incredible partnership. I call it the badass merger. It's like, it is <laughs> like, you know, between the algae and the coral. The problem is it has this Achilles heel. And that is that when the temperature rises by about two degrees Celsius for a few weeks, and we don't know exactly the mechanism behind it, but the algae leaves the coral. And when it leaves, it takes its color. And so the algae, the coral is then called bleached because it looks, you, what you're seeing is the white skeleton underneath it. But when, it when the algae leaves, it also takes all that photosynthetic fuel with it. So suddenly the coral is starving. And if the temperature drops before a few weeks, the symbiosis can be reestablished, the algae can recolonize the coral, but if not, the coral will die. And it's estimated that about half the coral in the world have already died because of bleaching. But I just want to say all is not lost because there is still a lot of coral left. Even when we know the numbers are down, there's still a lot of coral. So I don't want people to walk away and give, say, oh, we shouldn't even bother with coral reefs. There's so much left to care about. Other things that can affect coral are, um, they can be, because remember I said they, they like to live in kind of deserty environments. So pollution, runoff from land, brings in nutrients, and the coral just have not evolved to live with that kind of, in that polluted setting. And sedimentation also from runoff from land can cause problems. And then illegal fishing in some parts of the world, there's uh, blast fishing is one of the ways that people collect fish and that causes huge scars. Anchoring on reefs, you know, physical damage can cause reefs to suffer as well. But yeah, you mentioned the Great Barrier Reef, which there was just an announcement that coral cover is up by 35%. And I was just in Miami at a coral conference and I talked to one of the uh, Australian researchers who worked on that and he said it's true, but what they're seeing is a shift from coral that are more slow growing to what they call the more weedier species mm. that are accounting for that increase in coral cover. So there's a community shift happening um, and we'll have to see what that means for the, in, the community of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, now, you, in your book, you talk about some of the spectacular projects that scientists are carrying out to save coral reefs. Um, can you talk about them and why these projects are so important? Yeah, so there's, there's a big um, push within the coral community to do what's called coral restoration. And we've seen this kind of project on land with forest restoration and mangrove restoration. There's some seagrass bed restoration going on, but coral restoration is really hard because uh, you have to dive underwater. So you have, you can't, you have to train up to be able to do it. Coral larvae are, coral only spawn once a year. So having access to coral larvae to like replant babies is a very slow process. You only get one chance a year to get those larvae, although people are working on tricking coral into spawning at other times of the year. But yeah, I went around the world and I looked at different projects where people are working to restore coral reefs. And some of them are doing it by getting new babies out on the reef. And some of them are doing it by actually like building structures that stabilize the reef um, after like blast fishing, for example. And some of those projects are super successful. Uh, one of the most successful I saw was in Sulawesi, which is in Indonesia. And it was a restoration actually um, undertaken by the Mars Candy Bar Company, which is unexpected, but mm -hmm. they have factories in Indonesia for chocolate. And they recognized how the people who worked in the factories were suffering as the reefs became less healthy. And so they started working on um, this project. And what they developed are these things called reef stars. They're sort of um, 
rebar structures that they network together into a galaxy of stars. And um, they've restored about 10 hectares of reef, which is pretty good. Um, that's the largest restoration right now, but they're just about to start a new, what's called a mega restoration in Saudi Arabia. And the aim for that one will be 100 hectares. Wow. Yeah. Now, uh, some might say that these uh, geoengineering processes are controversial. Is it our role to fix the planet like that? I think this is a really important question to be debating right now. I think, um, I do think that with, when it comes to coral, if we can find things to do to stabilize the reef, to bring it back, then we should. There's a lot of questions about how much money we should invest into that and if there are other things we should do instead. For example, building wastewater treatment plants um, that may have a larger effect but not be quite so photogenic. Mm. And so, yeah, I think in, in every site, those decisions need to be made um, on a site-by-site -site basis. But this is an important conversation and, and question to keep asking as we do kind of move forward. Let's move on from coral reef to your obsession. Uh, that, those are your words. Uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about jellyfish? And particularly, of course, um, we were talking earlier about the Adriatic and the problems there. Um, so um, jellyfish. Uh, it's a big topic. So <laughs> jellyfish are, like I said, so jellyfish and coral are first cousins. And um, I don't know. What, well, so you know, in the Adriatic, there's a bigger problem with jellyfish now. Um, and it, it actually, in, in the Mediterranean in general, there's been a, a growth of jellyfish numbers. Um, some of that is because of invasive species situations. Jellyfish can be brought in in the ballast of boats and establish themselves. Um, others are the flow through the Suez Canal is generally into the Mediterranean. And um, with the expansion of the canal a few years ago, a new species has arrived in the eastern Mediterranean called the nomadic jellyfish that now clogs power stations every summer. But maybe I should tell you like a cool thing. <laughs> yeah. So when you get stung by a jellyfish, like, yes, it hurts. And I am so sorry that <laughs> for that. But there's a piece of it which is really interesting, which is that the jellyfish is stinging cell which is actually the same stinging cell that coral and sea anemones have, is um, it's kind of, it's, it's a capsule that fills up with water. And then when it's triggered, the stinger explodes out of there at an acceleration of 5 million Gs. So 5 million times the acceleration of gravity. So imagine if I had a pen and I could drop it, that's one G. So the explosion of a stinging cell is five million times faster. It's really hard to even imagine. And it's the fastest known motion in the animal kingdom and or in nature, really. And so when you are stung, <laughs> think about it as an encounter <laughs> with something quite magnificent. Um, part of the reason that jellyfish have been able to survive for about half a billion years. Jellyfish are one of the oldest, maybe the oldest animal that still exists on our planet. And part of the reason for its success is this incredible stinging cell, which it uses to hunt and also to defend itself. And basically, that's all it needs. It doesn't need much more than that um, to have survived all these millions, hundreds of millions of years. Thank you. We'll, re we'll, <laughs> we'll all remember that when we're stung by jellyfish. Um, um, you spent seven years uh, building mathematical algorithms to interpret satellite imagery um, of the ocean. Um, what are the processes and move, movements making it visible? Is there, a, is there a Google Street View of the, of, if you like, of, of the underwater world? There is a Google Street View of the underwater world. There is a guy named, I don't know if any of you have seen the movie Chasing Coral, but the main character in that movie, his name is Richard Vivers, and he was an advertising executive in London. And he was asked, uh, please make a campaign around why four-ply toilet paper is better than three-ply. And he was like, there has to be more than light to, the, to life than this. And he walked out of his London office and became, he started something called the Ocean Agency, which is basically an advertising firm for the ocean. And he teamed up with Google um, when he discovered that there is no, there is no 
actual map of all the coral reefs in the ocean, mm. which is astonishing. And people are finding new coral reefs all the time. And there's so so the understanding the baseline of coral is is really really important. And so he actually developed these cameras. Of, they're really cool looking underwater cameras and. They take three-dimensional images, and he ha had a, a team that they, they go down and they video. Um, there's some places you can find in the Great Barrier Reef where they video it, and then they load it up to Google Earth, and you can dive down and dive on the coral reefs from your desktop computer. Wow. So there is, it's not comprehensive, it's not everywhere, but I think it's in something like 28 countries. Wow. Mm -hmm. Now, you often mention uh, E.O. Wilson's uh, biophilia concept in your talks. Could you tell us what, um, what this is, what this biophilia concept um, is, in layman's terms? <laughs> no, it's not hard. I think we're sitting in it right now. Okay. So uh, I think that that's a really nice connection to Serena's talk before this. Um, biophilia is simply just the idea that we as humans have a connection to nature yeah. and that it's part of our DNA, it's part of our makeup, that we are connected. And, and you see it in the fat ways that we bring nature the, into our homes, onto our clothing, into our design products. I mean, pets even. We, we want to be connected to nature in a way that's uh, sort of beyond our control. And I think that's the simple, simple idea of it. And um, thinking of that, I mean, that goes beyond just being part of nature, but also um, how we affect nature and how nature um, affects us. You once said that the ocean absorbed everything and suffered in silence. In your book, uh, Life on the Rocks, there's a strong message there about mental health, another fight that often happens in silence. Could you share a bit more about that and why you decided to include that? Yeah, when I was working on the book about coral, my 14-year-old um, daughter um, became quite, she just changed. She became different. She, she isolated herself from friends. She started failing out of school. And ultimately, it turned out she was suffering from very severe um, obsessive compulsive disorder. And as I was trying to understand more about the corals, I was also trying to understand what, more about what was happening to her. And when I was writing the book, I was invited on an incredible, an incredible opportunity to go on a research trip to Australia to go out on, um, on a research cruise with some scientists who are doing a, a geoengineering, actually, a pilot project, mm -hmm. which is called cloud brightening. And the idea is that uh, marine clouds, clouds over oceans are are not as bright as clouds over land because there's fewer nucleators, there's fewer little particles for the water droplets to form around. So if you take seawater and aerosolize it and send salt crystals up into the clouds, you make them a little brighter. And if you make them just a degree, a percent or two brighter, you actually can cool underneath those clouds by a degree or two, which is just what the corals need to not bleach. So I had been invited out on this research project and I was so excited that at the same time my daughter was shutting down so badly, she could hardly leave the house. And this was all in March of 2020. So we know what happened. I was not allowed to go into Australia. My daughter was admitted to a hospital that could help her. And in the United States, there's only 36 beds in the country for severe adolescent OCD. So I ended up my husband and I ended up driving my daughter 1,000, well, 1,500 kilometers to Wisconsin so that she could um, get, get the treatment she needed. At the same time, this research team that I was supposed to have been with, but I wasn't allowed to go with, drove the same distance to Townsville, Australia to go out and, and try to get this research cruise off to sea. And the parallels of that made me think about a lot of parallels between mental health and what's happening with the coral. Um, in particular, coral, as I kind of said at the very beginning, are so foundational to the health of the ocean. And I, I, you know, it, all of these animals depend on them, so much life depends on them, but our mental health is also so foundational. Without mental health, I watched as my daughter's friendships, her academics, and basically her future just melted away. Similarly, both of these things are so invisible so often, 
Mm. As humans who are terrestrial, we don't think about the ocean every day. And also, sometimes it's very hard for us to see the suffering beneath the surface of a person. Yeah. And then the last parallel was that when it comes to the oceans and with mental health, you know, there's never any silver bullets. We want just like a simple single answer, but that just doesn't exist. What exists is hard work, a lot of time, and constant vigilance. And that's how you get better. But yeah, and so in both, of, in all of these ways, I felt like the stories kind of amplified each other and I ended up connecting them together in the book with my daughter's approval and my editors <laughs> telling me that she thought the writing was, was powerful. That's great to hear. That's, thank you for that. Um, uh, I suppose maybe taking that on, stepping back a bit, I mean, how do you see humanity's connection to nature to see now? How do you, how do you think people's attitudes are, are developing? I mean, I, I'm really encouraged, I, I would say. I, I think that there's a huge shift happening, and I think we all feel it with, you know, kind of the SDG, sus sustainability, development and governments, or diversity and governance goals that are happening. I think consumers are putting pressures on businesses to be more sustainable, to consider their footprint you know, the conversation we, you just had about architecture and how important it is to consider nature and then closing the loop later on. I mean, these were things that we were not talking about even when I started researching this book in 2018. Mm. So I think there's more hope right now than there has been in a long time that there's pressures in the right direction to bring us to a place where we do, you know, treasure this planet for all that it has, all the incredible biodiversity and and you know just seeing those kind of great vibrant coral reefs yeah, um, we were talking about the fact that for um, uh, generation Z and generation Y um, sustainability um, is the second most important issue ahead of health ahead of jobs um, what are we doing what are we doing right what are we doing wrong well we certainly need more urgency around climate change I would say Climate change is the number one threat to coral reefs, and if we could write that or start to write that, it would make an enormous difference. Five weeks from now, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, will meet in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt, on the edge of the Red Sea, on the edge of this coral reef that basically blew my mind and changed my life. And the decisions that those policymakers are making right there absolutely influence the reefs just a few kilometers from their decision-making bodies. So I think the more we can really help policymakers, look, this matters, it matters now, it matters urgently, the better. And I also believe that we really are kind of past the point of individual contribution. I think that the place we have to push is on systemic change because, uh, you know, me worrying about my carbon footprint is not going to get us where we need to get right now. Um, and uh, I guess then maybe what would your final message be to um, the audience? What can they do to help um, specifically in your specialist area um, uh, on oceans, on sea, and coral reef, and maybe more generally on, on sustainability? In terms of oceans, uh, just talk about them more, you know? Let people know that the oceans are out there, that they matter, that they are part of, they're integral to our, our well-being and our planet. Um, I really think the, the biggest thing we can do is talk to our elected officials and tell them how much the environment matters, how much climate change matters, because those decisions are the decisions that are going to get us where we go. And then again, like putting pressure on corporations and businesses to improve their behaviors is another way we can have an impact. But please give, uh, give Julie a very big thank you for speaking to us today. Thank you so much for being here.